everybody. My name is Gabriella Ryan, and I'm a senior application scientist here at Omni. We are a global leader in laboratory homogenizer manufacturing, and I'm joined today by the wonderful Dr. Maite Sabalsa from Euromune. Euromune is a leader in uh, diagnostics and in laboratory manufacturing as well. And today we hope to share with you some insights on the diagnostic testing landscape, as well as some future outlooks and advancements that we're seeing. And so Maite, I wanna pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Gabby. Hi, everyone. And Gabby, first of all, I would like to say thank you for inviting me and giving us this opportunity to share my thoughts. And I'm excited to talk about this in the next uh, couple of minutes. So I'm Maite Zabalza and I am the Senior Scientific Affairs Manager at Euroimmune US. My background is in infectious diseases. I did my PhD working with HIV and then as a postdoc, I was working with human cytomegalovirus and then uh, developing diagnostic assays for emerging infectious diseases. I joined Euroimmune around six years ago, and as a part of my role in the Scientific Affairs team, I'm working with the science behind our products and also establishing scientific collaborations with key opinion leaders. Thank you. Thanks, Maite. Well, you're definitely an expert in your field of diagnostics, and we are very glad to have you with us today. So. You know, to get things started off, could you give us a little bit of an overview of the diagnostic and uh, the companion diagnostic testing landscape? Yeah, sure. So both landscapes are evolving rapidly because of the new advancements in technology, regulatory shifts, and also because the healthcare needs are also evolving and we need to adapt. One example is how home testing and home collection testing ha have advanced significantly in the last four years. The COVID-19 pandemic was a major turning point as it pushed to develop assays for home testing. All familiar with open the door for other home collection testing. And in fact, since 2020, the FDA has approved three more home collection testing for sexually transmitted infections. And these are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And this is very important because uh, thanks to the home collection testing, we can have more people tested. We know that there is some stigma that or people can be embarrassed to go to in-person testing because this is a sexually transmitted infection. But thanks to the home collection testing, more people will be tested and also we will be able to prevent the spread of the infection. So this is an example of how the pandemic helped us in a way to have more assays or to be more familiar with home collection testing. And we will have more uh, new assays and yeah, we will discuss in the future how this will evolve. Yeah, that's that's great, Maite. You know, I think I think we can all definitely agree that you know, at-home testing has definitely reduced barriers. Uh, I can think of a few times myself that, uh, you know, at-home testing during the COVID-19 pandemic has helped me, you know, be able to get an answer um, and, you know, potentially reduce the spread of, of infection. Um, and, you know, now that we have an idea about the current testing landscape, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you um, about any, any new trends or new technology adoptions that you're seeing. And is there anything you're particularly excited about? Yeah, I'm excited about different things, but one thing that comes to mind is um, new developments in hormone testing. So even though hormone testing has been around us for a long time and there are well-established methods, there is still room for improvement to provide uh, accurate results and also to make it more accessible for patients. So one example is free testosterone. The gold standard or the traditional method to test for that is uh, equilibrium dialys dialysis followed by LCMS. So this is a very 
good and accurate technique. However, only specialized labs can perform this testing. So the other labs, they have to send the sample to these labs. But now with the new technologies and methodologies, there are FDA approved immunoassays based on chemiluminescence that allows to perform this testing in routine clinical labs. The technology is easier to and faster to use than the traditional methods. And also the results are accurate. So this is what I like, how well-established methods are, can be improved and we are improved them. So these are things that uh, are evolving and the goal as always is to help our labs and finally the patients to have the most accurate and uh, accessible tests. Another yeah. example. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's that's great, my take. C continue, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, I got excited, Gabby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another example is how, in this case, is the application of uh, current technology or testing. It has evolved or has adapted to a new application. So in this case, it's uh, APOE genotyping for Alzheimer's disease. So this is a genetic test that... In the past, it has been used to determine if a person has a higher risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And this is because the presence of a specific allele, APOE4. So if a person has this APOE4 allele, it has a higher risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. However, with the new drugs that have been approved uh, by the FDA, like lecanemab and donanemab, there is a need to use this genetic testing for a different application. So these new drugs are a major breakthrough in the field. And the thing is that they are associated with some side effects that they are called specifically with the amylo-related imaging abnormalities area. So patients or individuals that have that allele, the APOE4, they are at higher risk to develop this side effect. So for this reason, now there is a need to screen the patients before receiving these new treatments. We need to make sure that they are not APOE4 allele positive, because if they are, then the physicians, they need to manage uh, the treatment differently to avoid these uh, consequences that can be uh, very serious in some instances. So here we can see how in the past we were using this genetic testing just to predict the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but now as the field evolved with new drugs, there is also a new need. So we need to adapt that test to the need or to help on with the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that that's great, Maite. You know, it's it's really nice to see the you know the drug landscape, uh, and then you know new drugs being released, um, and you know like you said as well that that testing landscape also needs to sort of bring up to par, and uh, also needs to you know evolve as well in advance to you know match these new drugs that are coming out and being able to test you know patients accordingly and really help inform those treatment decisions. So it's it's really uh, nice to see that that these advances in, in Alzheimer's uh, treatment and, you know, um, testing is is sort of, you know, being matched in that in those instances that you described. So I'm interested now sort of stepping into the field of infectious disease. Could you talk about any advances that you've seen in that field? Yeah, uh, so there is a lot of research going on on antimicrobial resistance. And particularly, I'm interested in the new molecular assays that are being developed for antifungal resistance. So the traditional method to detect uh, antifungal resistance is by doing culture followed with susceptibility testing. And this technology can take up to a few weeks to get the results. So we need faster methodologies and also accurate in order to provide the results um, for to our patients. And this is very important for invasive fungal infections where there is a need to have these results the, the fastest, the best the faster, the better. So in these cases, uh, I'm following how 
manufacturers and also uh, institutions are working on new methodologies for detection of antifungal resistance. Another field that I'm excited always is emerging infectious diseases because that was my background. And I'm particularly interested in Oropush virus. So this um, virus before last summer, it was only, there were some outbreaks, small outbreaks in some countries in South America and Central America. But in last summer, we saw a large outbreak in Brazil and other countries in South America. And also there we observed like serious consequences, like there were some fatalities in adults as well as in newborns. So this is a emerging virus. We didn't know a lot about this virus, but now we re we act oh, very fast in order to manage the the infections and to help to prevent the spread. So even though these outbreaks are all mainly in South America or Central America, because of traveling, we also see these cases in the United States. So there is really a need to develop new assays or to be prepared for these emerging infectious diseases and. Uh, this is Oropus is the last one, the latest one, but I'm sure we will see other emerging viruses in the future. So we need to be prepared. Oh, a little bit of a different topic. So uh, biomarker discovery, Maite, um, mm -hmm. do you see anything, you know, helping streamline the basic research phase uh, into sort of translational research on into as well regulated or mandated testing? Have you seen any sort of, uh, you know, paths to help streamline that process right from the research phase all the way out into regulated testing. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so in my opinion, I, I've been working in academia and now in industry. The most important thing is to increase collaboration between academia, industry, as well as regulatory bodies. This is going to facilitate all the steps from discovery to implementation. So academic partnerships between ac academia and industry is going to bring the cutting edge science or the new biomarkers, then we need industry to make it uh, or to make the transition and make it available for the patients and the labs. And we also need to work very close with the regulatory agencies in the countries. So all together, we can if we work as a team, we can bring faster and more accurate assays uh, to the patient. And so that is one thing. The other thing that I had experienced is um, we really need centralized biobanks and data sharing platforms to accelerate the development of new assays or the discovery of biomarkers. So particularly when we develop a new assay or we have identified a new biomarker that is going to help us to on the uh, to it is going to help us to diagnose a disease we need clinically characterized samples in order to validate it and this is always challenging in the beginning for this reason we really need to work together again academia industry and regulatory agencies to get those samples and make the development faster. And this doesn't apply only to clinical characterized samples. In my opinion, we also need to have um, a more diverse cohort of samples. We need DBS, dried blood spots, fingernails, or hair. We need a diverse sample type in order to help us to, okay, what is the best sample for this specific in infection or disease, and also to make non-invasive uh, methods that is going to help at the end of the day, the patient. Yeah, that's, uh, I couldn't agree more with you and, you know, bridging that gap between research uh, to bring those biomarkers uh, to regulated diagnostic use does require collaboration and team efforts. So, you know, speaking from my perspective as well, um, you know, the efficiency and ease of use that you spoke about, 
uh, you know, making sure sample types are accessible. Um, you know, I can really relate to that, right? My experience has been, you know, traditionally on the front end of the workflow, right? With the Omni portfolio, oftentimes that biggest time sink in in the workflow is that first step, right? How do I break apart this sample and release my analyte of interest, right? <laughs> and, you know, helping scientists bridge that gap, not only with sample collection and having accessibility to samples, but also with the process of taking that sample and performing that research, um, you know, speeding up every step of the workflow will will help us, you know, in the long run with everything, right? So um, speaking of efficiency, right, in the lab especially, what are some barriers that you may have seen labs face in your experience? And, you know, on the other side of that, what are some potential solutions that you might recommend to help labs with their execution and also the efficiency? Yeah. Yeah, there are mm, different challenges that came to mind now, but I believe right now, the significant challenge that the labs are facing is uh, regulatory uncertainty regarding the new rule from the FDA about laboratory developed test or LDT. So this new rule was announced in 2024, in May 2024. And now the labs, they need to submit the LDTs as a new assay. So the implications of this is that labs, they probably they need to make changes in their operational workflow. Also, they might need the expertise or regulatory experts in order to provide or to prepare these uh, submissions for the FDA. There is a four year period for the labs to be adapting this new rule. But we can expect that this can delay in a way the implementation or offering of these LDTs. So this is something that the labs, they are starting working on. And one of the solutions I would say is to have more collaborations with manufacturers in order to help to have this uh, moving faster and make it easier if possible. Paul, that is important for me and I always, I, I, I feel very excited is that we had an ELISA for the detection of antibodies against Zika before the pandemic or the big large outbreak that happened in 2016. And this is due to some scientific collaborations that we have with different institutions around the world. And in this case, we were doing research on a different emerging infectious disease that it was dengue. And our R&D team found also antibodies against a different antigen. And this is how we created or we developed the Zika assay. So it was available before the large outbreak. It, it happened the same with Oropush, that we had already a prototype re ready before uh, last summer. So just working together with institutions around the world with samples and also our R&D team being proactive, uh, this is something that is, go is helping us to provide support in this case for the Oropus virus outbreak and more to come. We keep doing a lot of research and collaborating with different institutions. That's great, Maite. And, you know, your immune is really demonstrating that dedication that you spoke about, sort of staying ahead of things. That's that's so key. I mean, I think if we all learned learned one thing from the, the COVID-19 outbreak in, in, in 2020, it's that we, we need to be better prepared and stay ahead of these things. So it's really nice to see that dedication that your immune has and yourself as well as a team. You guys are really, you know, staying in tune with the research, keeping your ears and eyes open for p potential new uh, research opportunities in the lab. So it's really nice to hear that, um, you know, always, always, always nice to speak with you, Maite. Hopefully we can uh, chat again soon about any late breaking uh, advancements in, in diagnostics. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really nice chatting with you. Thank you for joining me today. Um, and, uh, and I hope you have a great day, Maite. Thank you very much, Gabby. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And yeah, we will we can catch up and speak more in the future. Thank you. <laughs>